Well, happy Easter. Welcome to the virtual gathering of First Baptist Enterprise. We do have uh, seven, eight, or nine people in the sanctuary today, but uh, we, we are thankful that uh, you get to gather, and we get to gather through these virtual means, and so I'm, I'm, I'm thankful for that, and I just want to uh, encourage you on this Easter Sunday morning this Resurrection Sunday, that while our normal church service is canceled in terms of how we normally do it, the Resurrection is not canceled, and it never will be. And so this morning is an exciting morning. We get to celebrate the resurrected life that Christ purchased for all of his followers. You know, in the early church, when a Christian would greet another Christian, often they would say, one would say to the other one, He is risen. And then the other one would respond by saying, he is risen indeed. So in light of that tradition, I think it would be great to, to say this together in your, uh, with your family, in your living room or kitchen or wherever you're gathering right now around your house. So I'm going to say, he is risen. And what I want to encourage you to do is to shout it out. Like you, it may sound a little weird, it may feel a little weird, but I want you to shout it out like you mean it. I want you to say it with gusto as if eternity for you is hinging on this resurrection. And so I'm going to say it three times and you, every, after every time I say he is risen, you just say he is risen indeed. And you say it like you mean it. Here we go. He is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. Our call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 92, verses 1 through 4. This is what the Word of God says. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your steadfast love in the morning and your faithfulness by night, to the music of the lute, and the harp to the melody of the lyre. For you, O Lord, have made me glad by your work. At the works of your hands, I sing for joy. Father in heaven, we thank you for the works of your hands in creation as we look at, at flowers blooming and birds singing. But more than anything, we thank you for your work, the work of your hand in redemption in taking a wretched sinner like me and like us and making us well, making us whole, giving us forgiveness, giving us eternal life. This is what the resurrection is screaming at us this morning. And so help us to worship rightly. Help us to worship properly. Help us to worship you in spirit and in truth on this resurrection Sunday morning. We pray this in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and all God's people said, Amen. First Baptist family, COVID-19 may have separated us on this Easter Sunday morning, but we are still one in spirit as we gather in our homes to worship the risen Christ. I invite you to join us as we sing this great hymn of resurrection. Christ the Lord is risen today, Alleluia. Sons of men and angels say, Alleluia. Raise your joys and triumphs high, Alleluia. Sing ye hands and earth reply, Alleluia. Lives again our glorious King, Alleluia. Where old death is now thy steed, Alleluia. Dying ones, he all doth save. Alleluia. Where thy victory, O grave. Alleluia. He is not dead. He is alive. We have his Done. Hallelujah. 
we now where Christ has led. Alleluia. Following our exalted head. Alleluia. Made like Him, like Him we rise. Alleluia. Ours the cross, the grave, the skies. Alleluia. Alleluia. Indeed, He is risen. And I'm so thankful that we are able to gather in this empty sanctuary to worship today because of an empty tomb. I invite you to sing us as we continue to worship together. I cast my mind to Calvary Where Jesus bled and died for me I see His wounds, His hands, His feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. His body bowed and drenched in tears, they laid Him down in Joseph's tomb. Sealed by heavy stone, Messiah still and all alone. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise His name forevermore. Forever. of dawn, the Son of Heaven rose again, O oh, trampled death, where is your sting? The angels roar for Christ the King, O oh, praise the name of the Lord. blazing sun shall pierce the night and I will rise among the saints my gaze transfixed on Jesus face oh praise the name of the Lord our God oh praise
Our scripture reading this morning comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. And I would invite you at home to stand with us in reverence to the hearing of the very word of God, the living God. Let us hear God's word together. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. I'm about to go into the time of pastoral prayer, and as I do, I'm going to put on the screen for you the things that I'm going to be praying for today. And so what I would invite you to do is to gather as a family right now, and as I pray, you pray as a family for the things that you see listed on the screen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our God and our Father, we are thankful that you are a holy, righteous, omnipotent, sovereign God, that nothing changes you, that your truth, your glory, your goodness is not dependent upon our circumstances. They're not dependent upon whether or not your church can meet together. They're not dependent upon who lives and who dies. They're not dependent upon who is king or president or in charge in this world because you are in charge. You are sovereign. You are righteous. You are merciful and gracious. You are slow to anger and you are abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness and you maintain your love to generations upon generations yet you will not leave the wicked unpunished. And Father we recognize that this has been demonstrated for thousands of years and it culminated and climaxed in the death of your son and his resurrection from the grave. And so on this Easter Sunday, we come to you in worship knowing that at the cross, both your mercy and your grace and you not leaving the, the wicked unpunished were demonstrated in the fact that you punished your son and our wickedness on him so that you could give us mercy and grace. And in that, and after that, Jesus Christ rose from the dead, recognizing that it was truly finished, our sin had been dealt with, and that you were pleased with his sacrifice, and that there is hope now that we can be forgiven of our sins, and we may one day rise from the dead just as he has risen from the dead, and just as he will never go back into the grave, neither shall we upon our resurrection. Amen. And so, Lord, we pray in light of this truth that we would believe it. We pray we recognize that we struggle, we confess, we struggle to believe this to be true. We struggle in times of plenty and we struggle in hard times to believe this to be true. And so, Lord, we pray asking you, help us believe. We believe, help our unbelief. And so, Lord, we pray as you help us believe that you would then help us live. 
You would help us live not as people without hope, but people with hope, because we have a living hope in Jesus Christ. And therefore, allow us to lead our families well. Allow us to love our world well. Allow us to be committed to your church, to love the church in times of difficulty. Let us live in the faith and the boldness of the resurrected Jesus. I pray for families as they're praying right now that they would do the same. And Lord, we do pray for our members who are struggling with health. We pray that you, by your grace, would heal them. But Lord, we pray that they would have hope that though our bodies may fail us now, just like Jesus' body did not fail him when he rose, one day they will rise and so will we because Jesus has rose and risen for us. So Lord, we pray for those struggling with health. Lord, we also pray for our community. We recognize right now that there are literally millions of people in our country who are unemployed, and there are people in our community who are unemployed, and there are people who are struggling financially. Lord, we pray that you would show us how we can be a light in the midst of the darkness, how we can help those in need, how we can love those who need love during this time. And so, Lord, in the midst of uncertainty, we pray that we would be the church and that we would be able to help those who need help. And, Lord, we also pray for a cure for this virus. Lord, we pray that you would miraculously not allow it to, uh, to spread as fast as it has said it was going to spread. We pray that, that you would uh, relieve those who are in pain. We pray that it, you would stop the spread and not allow it to come back later. Uh, Lord, we also pray for uh, treatments to be uh, come up with so that you, we can deal with the symptoms of the virus so that you can allow us to get back to work and help our economy again. Lord, we pray that a vaccine would be implemented quickly. But Lord, whether or not those things happen, we pray that you would act and we pray that you would act in a mighty way. And Lord, we have prayed for revival. And if this is how you have chosen to send it to us, we pray that our hearts would be aligned with yours. And that you would send revival to your people and you would send revival to your world and we would see many people come to faith through this. I pray if there are people watching this right now as they hear these songs sung and they hear the word of God preached that their hearts would be changed to love you and live for you and believe in the message of the resurrected Christ. And it is in his name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Pastor Caleb. If you got your Bible at home, uh, go ahead and turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And uh, before we dig into that, I just want to say a few things. First of all, uh, as, you've, a, a, as you probably know, we have a resources page on our um, uh, on our uh, fbcenterprise.com slash resources. You can get that uh, at that webpage. You know, we exist to glorify God by making disciples of all nations. And so what we want to do is equip you to do just that. So in your home, we want you, discipleship should be continuing on. Uh, but if you maybe live by yourself, uh, we, we want you to personally grow. And so we're, just, we're putting out just about every day uh, several different resources in order for you to grow and in order to equip you to do the work of ministry in your home and community. So you can uh, check out our website and then also follow us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and then like us on YouTube. Um, <clears throat> secondly, tomorrow, or actually next Sunday, we're, we're starting a new sermon series and it's called Acts, the Church on Mission. And I'm really excited about this sermon series because we spent about a year and a half in the book of Luke, in the gospel of Luke. And Acts was written by the same author. It was written by Luke. 
And it's kind of like part two of, Jesus, of, of, of Luke's gospel. And, and the, Luke's first gospel, is the gospel of Luke, talks mainly about Jesus and his life, his ministry, his miracles, his death, his resurrection and ascension. And then in Acts, we see the Holy Spirit given to the church and then how the church went to the ends of the earth. And so we want you to follow along. This is going to be a long journey with the church. We're going to be digging in. And so go ahead and start reading the book of Acts. Get really familiar with it. But every Sunday when we show up, when you show up, I want you to know what we've been, what we're actually about to unpack. And so every week we're going to, we, we have this new podcast and a new uh, Bible reading plan called Simple Rhythms. And it's just that. We want you to be in the rhythm of getting into God's Word and uh, leading up to the, when the church gathers right now virtually. Uh, as we are scattered, we're, we're thinking through the same concepts, reading the same scriptures. And so you can go to iTunes or Spotify or just look at the back of the First Baptist Weekly and uh, all the information will be right there. Uh, but, but this will be a great way to have a simple and steady diet of God's Word as we pray the same things, we listen to the same song, and we are basically doing three things, read, pray, and sing as a church. And then lastly, if you would like to worship through giving, I've said this every week, you can mail your check to the church office. We will still be able to receive that. Uh, you can give online at fbcenterprise.com. We have a drop box at the Welcome Center, or you can text to give at 334-518-3141. Now, before we dig into this text, I just want to say uh, something very personal. I would imagine that in 127 years that this may be the first time that First Baptist intentionally did not gather for worship, corporate worship, on Easter Sunday. And I tell you, I've been doing a lot of thinking leading up to this. And I just want to say how much I love First Baptist Enterprise. I love the people here. I love being your pastor. Back in 1998, when I was still a teenager, it was actually through the ministry of First Baptist Enterprise and in this very sanctuary that I'm standing in right now that the gospel landed on my heart. Now, my... my um, home church that I grew up with and the people that poured into me, my parents and everything else. So, I mean, they taught me the ways of the Lord, but it was all in God's timing. And it was through the ministry of First Baptist Enterprise that all of a sudden my eyes were open. The scales fell off my eyes and I, and I trusted in Christ and I came to know the sweetness of Christ. And at that time, I had no idea that one day I'd be the senior pastor here and also had no idea how much I would love the people here at First Baptist Enterprise. And now we are, and we have been, hit with a great tribulation. And it's affected everyone, and it's affecting everything. It's been said that absence makes the heart grow fonder, and I tell you, I can testify to that because because I miss the, seeing the people of First Baptist Enterprise, their faces. I miss seeing your faces and hearing your voices and, and hearing you talk to me and encourage me and me able to encourage you and, and seeing the, the interactions between other people and, and being able to see you singing out to God and crying out to God and, and responding to me as I preach God's word. It's, it's just not the same. And it's been said, you don't know what you got until it's gone. And I think we can all re resonate with that. It's easy to take for granted the, the ability to gather for worship. I know I did. Not that I didn't enjoy it or, or look forward to it. It was like the highlight of my week. I loved it. But I just assumed it was always going to be there. And now it's been... It's been stripped from us, at least for a time. And it's reminded me not only of what a privilege it is to be able to gather, but it's reminded me how much I love the people with whom I get to gather. And what's gut-wrenching is the distress and the uncertainty that we're all facing And yet, if you think about it, 
It's not a far cry from what Christians experienced that first Easter. In fact, I would make this bold claim that this Easter, 2020, we are actually better positioned to grasp the true meaning of that first Easter than we've ever been, at least in our lifetime. That we're, we have a better posture of embracing a real and raw meaning of that first Easter, this Easter, than we were last Easter and the Easter before that and the Easter before that. You see, the first Easter, no children rose early to go hunt eggs. We didn't have chocolate bunnies to eat. You didn't, you, the, the first Christians didn't dress up in their little pastel outfits and take their little pictures in front of azalea bushes. That didn't happen. But what did happen is for the few band of followers who had not abandoned Jesus, they were racked with fear and hopelessness and confusion and uncertainty. What does this mean? What, 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 what could this be? I saw him perform these miracles. How could it be a sham? I don't understand. What are you doing, God? I left it all for you. And now he's dead? It doesn't make sense. And yet in light of their confusion and hopelessness, Something happened that changed everything. You see, what happened that first Easter changes everything, even the way that we approach this Easter some 2,000 years later. But we've got to ask the question, what did happen? And what's the significance of it? And how are we to respond to it? So today what we're going to do is just explore three big questions of Easter what happened, why does it matter, and what must we do? That's where we're going. Three questions. What happened, why does it matter, and what must we do? What must I do? So let's jump in. First of all, what happened? What happened that first Easter? Well, here's the answer. Jesus rose from the dead. Very simple, but very profound. And you, may think, you may think, well, how do you know that to be true? And some skeptics, if you're a skeptic, you're watching on, you may, see, you may say, well, now see, that's, that's what I don't like about Christians is that they're just all about blind faith. And maybe you, you've been walking with Jesus and you've bought into this idea that, that really Christianity is about blind faith. We just believe it and we don't think about it. But see, that's not what biblical Christianity is or what biblical faith is. Instead of blind faith, we could, I think, say it better or more biblical by saying we as Christians, we are embracing reasoned faith. Reasoned faith. In fact, let me give you three reasons why it's reasonable to believe that Jesus rose from the dead. First of all, the scriptures. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 and 4. He says, for I've delivered to you. Stop right there. <clears throat> Who's the you? Well, in verses 1 and 2, he addresses brothers. He's saying, Christians of Corinth. These, this is for Christians. I want to remind you of the gospel. I want to remind you of something that is so essential that you can't be a Christian without it, but it's so profound that you'll never move on from it. And that's the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then he says, I deliver to you as of first importance. In other words... This is foundational. It was for them and it is for us. This is something we never move on from. In fact, if we ever lose it, we lose all of Christianity. So what is it, Paul? For I deliver to you as of first importance. What is this? He says, what I also received. And this is it. That Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures. That he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Now notice he says twice, in accordance with the scriptures. Now what he's talking about right there specifically is the Old Testament. 
You see, in the Old Testament, there were 60 major prophecies about the coming future Messiah. Long before Jesus ever came, there were 60 major prophecies describing the, the, the circumstances of his life and his death and his birth and all of those things. And here's the kicker, Jesus fulfilled every one of them perfectly. Micah said that the Messiah will be born in Bethlehem. Jesus, historical fact, born in Bethlehem. That's not something that he could manipulate. Isaiah said the Messiah will be born of a virgin. The mother of Jesus is Mary. We call her the Virgin Mary. Psalm 22 describes a crucifixion in explicit terms, in very graphic terms, talking about he's pierced his hands and his feet. Now, what's interesting about that is that was written 800 years before crucifixion was ever a means of capital punishment. And Zechariah said the Messiah will be betrayed by 30 pieces of silver. Matthew 27 says that Judas betrayed Jesus, and he did so for 30 pieces of silver. Now here's what's really interesting. Two mathematicians sat down and calculated the probability of one man fulfilling only eight of these prophecies in the Old Testament And given the time distance and and the the language distance and the culture uh, distance and all of those things, they said it would be, if one man fulfilled only eight of those prophecies, it would be one in ten to the 17th power. Let me give you an illustration that just kind of sums that up or, 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 or paints that picture for you. If you were to put silver dollars over the entire state of Texas, and they were two feet deep, so the state of Texas, silver dollars, all over the entire state, and they're two feet deep. So you're just wading around in, walking around in nothing but silver dollars. And you would take one of those silver dollars, only one, and mark a star on it with a Sharpie marker. And you just throw it somewhere in the middle of Texas. Maybe it's in the north part, south part, maybe eastern or western region, what have you. And then you would take a a man who was blindfolded and he walked around as long as he wanted to all around the state of Texas and he had one chance, one opportunity to reach down and pick one silver dollar up and the, <laughs> the odds that he picks the one with a star are the same as Jesus fulfilling only eight of these 60 major prophecies and ladies and gentlemen, Jesus filled all 60 of those prophecies it's unthinkable you see Jesus is not just an add-on to the Old Testament he's the point of the Old Testament because the entire Old Testament pointed to him almost all of the Old Testament characters have major character flaws and so if you're buying into this idea that you need to be like Daniel or be like David or be like Jonah don't buy it Yeah, we can learn something from their lives, but they all had, or just about all of them, had major character flaws. Instead, they are all foreshadowing Jesus, who is the true and better Moses, who not only taught the law, but kept the law on our behalf. Jesus is the true and better David, who conquered the great giant, not Goliath, but the great giant of sin and death on behalf of God's people. Jesus is the true and better Daniel, who was cast into the lion's den of God's wrath, something much worse than Daniel experienced, so that you and and I would be spared. Jesus is the true and better Jonah who went into the belly of the earth and suffered the storm of God's wrath and resurrected on the third day. You see, where the Old Testament characters failed, Jesus did not. He obeyed perfectly even to the point of death, even death on a cross. And he died, but he rose again in accordance with the Scriptures. Second reason that I think this is reasonable, again, it may not be airtight in your mind, but it's at least reasonable to believe that Jesus rose from the dead, and that is the empty tomb. Look at verse 4. The Apostle Paul says, he, talking about Jesus, that Jesus was buried and he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. Now, when Paul says that Jesus was raised, he implies that there was an empty tomb. You see, the Gospels describe that there was an empty tomb. And what's interesting is all of the opponents of Jesus and all of the opponents of Christianity, they all acknowledge 
also that there was an empty tomb. They had the resources of Rome and they couldn't come up with a body. They come up with a body, the whole thing's a sham, the whole thing is put to rest, it has no traction. And the best thing they could come up with is that the disciples stole the body. Now let's think about this. Who are these men? You know who they were? They, they followed Jesus and yet at the very end they all were absolute cowards. Just about all of them. At his arrest and crucifixion they fled. They acted like cowards. And then just a, in a matter of days they became some of the most courageous men that this world has ever seen. Giving their lives for the sake of the gospel, being imprisoned, being stoned, being whipped, being beaten, even dying for Jesus. Now they say that he claimed to be God, the Son of God, and he claimed that he was going to die and resurrect, and they actually saw him dead, and they saw him resurrected, and th so that's what made them so courageous. Now that makes sense. That's good logic right there. And so the burden of proof is on the skeptic, I believe, to come up with an alternate story that makes sense of the courage displayed by these cowardly disciples. Listen, someone may, may die for a lie if they believe it's the truth. No one's going to die for a lie if they know it's a lie, especially a whole lot of people. I mean, at some point when you're being crushed, when your skull is being crushed by a big stone and you're being stoned, you're going to say, time out, tap out, here, let me go show you where the body is. But they didn't. And then thirdly, the eyewitnesses. The eyewitnesses. Look at verse 6. Then he appeared, talking about Jesus, after the resurrection, he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive. That's 500 people. That's 1,000 eyeballs. They saw Jesus. And he's saying most of them are still alive. If you don't believe it, go ask them. How could you get a massive crowd like that to agree to tell a lie to their death? It's improbable. It doesn't make sense. Jesus' life, his ministry, his miracles, his death, resurrection, and ascension, they were all public events. It wasn't like a man walked into a cave. He came out and he said, okay, believe this or die. They were public events. Here's the point. We do not embrace blind faith, but reasoned faith. It makes sense. We're not blindly basing our faith on some abstract claims of a person, but on good, reasonable, objective evidence. Jesus rose from the dead. Now, secondly, we ask the question, why does it matter? Why does it matter? Well, here's the answer. Without the resurrection, there's no forgiveness. Now, some may say, no, well, wait a minute. I mean, I know some Christians, and I, I, they're moral people, but I'm a moral person too. Why do I have to believe the resurrection? Why do I, why do I have to believe in Christ in order to, to be okay, in order to be the forgiveness of sins? To, to, I, why can't I just be a good moral person? I'm merciful. I'm forgiving. I, I, I'm loving. I like to be a servant, and these Christians I know are like that. Why can't I just be moral? Look at verse 17. He says, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Now let's think about those phrases. Your faith is futile. Meaning, this is all a fairy tale. It's all a sham. We pack our bags and we go home if the resurrection doesn't happen. But then look at that phrase, you are still in your sins. Here's what we know deep down, and, and you know this too. There's enough of the image of God left in all people that we know we ought to be perfect, but we're not. And sin, according to the Bible, is not just an isolated mistake. It is an affront against the character of God. And the Bible tells us that we've all sinned and we all fall short of the glory of God. Now here's where it gets really heavy and we need to feel the weight of this heaviness. 
Romans 6, 23 says the wages of sin is death. That's not just physical death, that's also spiritual death, eternal separation from God in hell. And we don't like to talk about hell, but the reality is Jesus taught more on hell than he did heaven. And the reason he did that is because he loves us. And the reason that there is a place called hell, the reason that that is the penalty for our sins is because God is just. If our sin is a front against God's character, that means that our sin is an infinitely horrible crime and God being just must, must extend a punishment that meets the crime. Therefore, the punishment must be infinitely horrible. And we love John 3.16. And we, that's the first verse that most Christians memorize and it ought to be. But we glaze over one word oftentimes. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. What does that mean? What does it mean to, to perish? What is he talking about right there? And why, why is it that the son of God had to come and be given and had to die in order for us to not perish what he's talking about is absolute condemnation of God that we are objects of the justified wrath of God and there's nothing that we can do to thwart that there's nothing that we can do to sidestep it it's not like we we get to the end and and if our good deeds outweigh our bad deeds then we'll be okay there is no amount of good works God says in his word that even your righteous acts are filthy rags to me even when we're at our best not when we're at our worst but when we're at our best and just after John 3 16 it says that Jesus came not into the world not to condemn the world but that the world was condemned already in other words, by default, we are condemned. We are under the condemnation. And the only way to lift that off of us, John 3.36 says, the wrath of God remains on those who reject the Son of God. The only way to lift that off is if Jesus himself does it. So here's why the resurrection is so important. Where you have sin, you have death. If he did away with sin, then he did away with death. And so he resurrected from the dead. In other words, the resurrection is the Father's amen to Jesus' statement on the cross. It is finished. It is God's signal to all mankind and to all of creation that the work of Christ is sufficient on our behalf. And so that means... That the payment has been made. That means that if you turn from your sin and trust in Christ, that you have been reconciled to God, that you have been forgiven of sin, that you have been made right with God, that you are now heirs of God, that you are in the favor of God, that you are children of God, that you get God. That is the good news of the gospel. The, the place where true joy is found is in the presence of God. That means that joy is awakened, shame is buried, hope is secure, and fear is driven away. No guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand. For he, I, I am his and he is mine, bought with the precious blood of Christ. That's the significance of the resurrection. And we could claim none of it if the resurrection did not happen. So, what must we do? What must I do? What must we do? The answer, receive and believe the gospel. Go back to verses 1 and 2. Paul says, now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received. There it is. Received. In which you stand. Verse 2. And by which you are being saved. If you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. You see that? 
We must receive and believe the gospel. So what is the gospel? The gospel is the good news that though we have sinned against God and deserve his eternal punishment, God has taken, has come through Jesus. He sent his son Jesus on a rescue mission for us to take on the punishment and the penalty for us by dying on the cross. And he showed that he paid the bill in full by resurrecting from the dead. And we must repent and believe in him. Turn from our sin and trust in him. Now, I want to be clear. The gospel is different from every other religion. Every other religion is based on works. The gospel is based on grace. The gospel at its core is not a new moral code. It is not a list of do's and don'ts. Every other religion is some form of man working his way to God. The gospel is the good news, the story of God coming down to mankind and bringing us up to him. The gospel is not about what we do for God, but about what he has done for us in Christ Jesus And ladies and gentlemen, Jesus has done it all. And Jesus has paid it all. And if you get him, you get it all. I was doing some prison ministry at one time and I I remember hearing an old Baptist preacher get up and he told this story about a wealthy widow who for years collected famous and rare paintings. She had one child, it was a son. She loved her son. She was so close to her son, she just poured into her son. And then tragically, her son died in the war and she was absolutely heartbroken. But then one day, a man showed up. She did not know. He knocked on the door and he said, you don't know me, but I just want you to know that your son died saving my life. And I don't have much to offer But I made a little sketch of him. And in this cheap frame, she gave he gave her just this little sketch, this simple sketch of her son. And she cherished it. She loved it more than any of her paintings. In fact, she she put it right there in the middle of these these hundred thousand dollars, half a million dollar paintings. Just this little, very insignificant but very precious sketch of her son. Well, the years passed and eventually she died. And because she didn't have any heirs, she, she had to, they, they auctioned off all of her belongings. And so uh, those who collected paintings uh, and, and other just millionaires came from miles around. They all gathered right there at her estate as they had a big auction. And the auctioneer got up and the first item in the list it was this little sketch of her son. And of course, everybody was confused. They were thinking, well, what is that? What is that? We, we, you know, we, we came for the famous paintings. And he started it out at $100, and nobody said anything, and so he kept lowering it until finally somebody, just to kind of move things along, said, $25. And he said, sold. And then he began packing things up. The auctioneer did began to pack things up and everybody said wait a minute we came out for the famous paintings the rare paintings we we want to see the painting we came to bid we're ready to bid on those paintings and he said what you don't understand there was a note left in her will and it read this whoever gets the son gets it all And I'll never forget the first time I heard that story. When that Baptist preacher told that story, I was sitting in the midst of prisoners. Many of whom were never going to see the light of day outside of that prison. For them, they had lost it all. And yet in that moment, there were tears coming down because it collided with their heart. They saw it and they knew what that meant. Because he made it very clear. The Bible makes it very clear. And I believe the Holy Spirit is making it very clear to us today that whoever gets the Son gets it 
all. And here's why this Easter today, this Easter in 2020 is closer to that first Easter than any Easter we've experienced. Is because some of us and maybe most of us fear losing everything. Our health, our wealth, our security, life as we knew it. It is uncertain. We don't know what this is going to turn out. We don't know how this is going to end. It may be a long time till we get together. We don't know what this is going to be. But ladies and gentlemen, by the authority of the Word of God, if you have the Son, you have it all. And so the question for us is do you have the Son? Do you have Jesus? Do you know Him? Because no matter what is stripped from us, if you have Him, you have it all. Not only the hope of heaven, but the joy of the presence of God being in the favor and the eternal hug of God. So if you'd like to receive the Son, if you'd like to believe the gospel, it's pretty simple. Just acknowledge that you're a sinner and you need grace. You need forgiveness. And then cry out to Jesus, the great Savior. Say to God in your own words, God, I, I believe Jesus died for my sins and rose again from my, on my behalf. And I'm no longer going to live for me. I turn from my sin and I trust in Jesus. If that's you, I, I just want to encourage you. We're going to have pastors standing by. You can email us at info at fbcenterprise.com. Put your name and phone number, we'll call you. We want to be able to pray with you. If you just need, if you just need prayer, we just want to be able to pray with you. And walk you through this glorious and beautiful truth. The gospel of Jesus Christ. And so now, Lord, we pray. That having received the Son, that we would know and we would believe. That if we have the Son, we have it all. He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not graciously with him give us all things? And so fill us with your spirit. Help us to trust in that truth, believe that truth, and help that truth to minister in our hearts right now. We pray this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. We're going to sing one last song and I just want you in your living room to, to stand up and you sing it like you mean it and it's that Jesus paid it all. Because of the resurrection we can sing this and we can stake our eternity on it. Jesus paid it all. Let's sing out.
strong I stand in him complete Jesus died my soul to save My lips shall still repeat Jesus made it all May the Lord bless you and keep you and may his face shine upon you and give you peace in the powerful, matchless, wonderful name of Jesus. Amen.